we are in content overload. Everyone is trying to grab our digital attention. In fact, according to a Nielsen survey, online content consumption has grown 215% from 2019 to 2020. Today's guest will teach us how to break through the noise and show up online to create meaningful connections. Have you ever felt like there's something more that you're supposed to be doing with your life, but you're not sure what? Welcome to She Made It, the podcast that uncovers the journey to living a life that feels more like you. I'm your host, El Zimmerman, and I'm here with my co-host, Clara. I have to tell you, this episode, as much as I adore our guest, when I was sort of thinking about the role that digital media, digital experiences have in our life, it, it gets a little overwhelming. And so the question that I want to pose to you and actually to all of our listeners is, what is your relationship with the internet? Yeah, so I feel like it's kind of a complicated thing right now, right? Because so many of us kind of had to move everything we were doing to the internet. But for me, I think I have a love-hate relationship with it because it definitely brings me closer to people like family and even people that I'm connected to or following on Instagram that I can talk to about things that either of us post about that I may have never gotten to connect with them about otherwise. But then on the other hand, especially after seeing The Social Dilemma, which is a documentary that I know you and I have both seen on Netflix, just thinking about what a time suck it can be and also how it's sort of designed to be a time suck and in some ways designed to polarize people. That's when I start to feel complicated about it, when I kind of think of it from a bird's eye view. So mixed feelings for sure. What about you? Yeah, I know um, because I think that I look at it a little bit more as a business tool. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I enjoy the same reasons you do. There's a connection element, but I'm actually not an avid social media user. I try to be more of a producer of content than a consumer of content. Mm -hmm. Um, And, but it, it, but, but it can be exhausting. So what I really loved about the conversation with Brandy was that she, her focus is how do we really create an experience? How do we create these meaningful connections? So I'm really excited about our next guest, Brandy Bernoski. She is the founder of Alchemy and AIM. It's a digital strategy and website development company, and she has this incredibly unique background. She studied science. She studied philosophy. She studied technology. And now she puts all of that together to help people translate their personal magic into digital experiences. And what is so fascinating about Brandy is that she's this lovely, very unassuming business owner, entrepreneur, but she's worked with the likes of Brene Brown, with Martha Beck. On today's episode, you'll learn how to show up as your authentic self online, how to magnetize your ideal client to you and discard those formulas that don't work. She'll teach us how to consume better content and then how to elevate our online presence. I think this is a great episode for us to be sharing right now, so I'm really excited to dive in. Welcome, welcome to this episode of She Made It. I am here with my guest, Brandy Bernoski, and we are so excited to have Brandy on today. She is a scientist yet artist, yet philosopher, yet physicist, who has taken all of her learning, all of her education, and melded into this really cool company, Alchemy and AIM, which is a technology company. And I'm going to let her share a little bit more about that. So welcome, Brandy. Thank you so much for having me here today, Elle. I'm so excited. Yeah. So Brandy, it was so fascinating to learn. I, I I want to share with our listeners that you and I met a couple years ago at an Allie Brown event. Um, it was an event bringing in pretty pretty successful female entrepreneurs from all over the world to how do we up level, how do we step into the genius of our business and really show up in an iconic way. And it was really it was really fun to meet you then. It was a great event. Yeah, her events are fantastic. And I have to say, like, I love meeting women like you and other women who are kind of looking at what else is possible and thinking differently about the world and their business. So it was it was a lot of fun. 
Yeah, especially now where we're almost forced to look at our businesses because the world is different. <laughs> yeah, this whole kind of recalibration with COVID is um, has been a really interesting experience in I know the word pivot is a little overused, but in pivot and reinvention and um, how do we shift to what what is going to be kind of like the next new normal? Yeah. One of the things that really caught my eye is um, your background is so unique and so interesting. And my listeners know that um, my background is in acting. I studied acting. I studied theater. I worked on the professional stage for over a decade. And that's sort of where you started too. In it, theater. it is. It, it's ex- exactly where I started. Um, yeah. I went off to college with the full intent to be an actor. Um, went to New York City, to NYU and studied at the Stella Adler Conservatory and loved, loved theater so much. Um, loved learning about it in different ways. I, I really appreciated that my education there wasn't just the practical piece of like how to be an actor, but also the very critical thinking piece of like, what are these plays that are being written? What do they say? And what are their comments on culture? So um, it it was kind of like a very full education. And uh, well, not to mention that you minored in like physics and math while getting the theater. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I was just bored on the side as if that's possible. I had, I had intended to be a physics major, um, but it just wasn't possible with the way the schedules worked out. And, um, you know, I, I have to say, like, I'm really, really glad for my, th- that I had that experience in theater. It taught me so much about how people think and operate and um, what drives us as human beings. And it also led me to the, the realization that, like, a long-term career in, in acting wasn't going to be the right fit for me. I just felt like, there was something deeper I wanted to get at about um, about who we are as human beings. So I kind of inevitably like just kept going in in school. Yeah, and then studying philosophy, religion, um, being in San Diego, and I just find it fascinating that all of your study in the humanities and the arts, but now you're in technology. Yeah, I wouldn't have predicted that either, but. It is such a perfect fusion of everything that I studied. So, you know, the, the physics and math is it was the foundation of the code that I knew. So I had like just a little bit and was able to teach myself. I was actually, I should say this. I became a website developer because I was a blogger. Like I was writing. That was actually like I was creating posts and taking images. And like I, I was just creating, honestly for the sake of it being fun and enjoyable and really just wanted to do something different with my site. So I had that base code knowledge, um, a little bit of HTML and a little bit of CSS and was able to start weaving that into my WordPress website. And suddenly I had friends calling me up because they saw what I was doing on my site and asked for help on their site. So, um, it, it was it was a very kind of unexpected turn in my life to get into like website development, but at the same time, when I look when I look at how I use, you know, the the base that I had from physics and and math for the code, um, philosophy for me was always about looking at the big picture. And I think if you're not doing that in any business, you know, you're missing out on something. Um, you know, theater, like I said, it goes right back to like understanding who people are and what they want and and what drives them. Like that's marketing. Right. I had, it just, it kind of worked out well. And I found myself um, as a freelance developer first and eventually as like a business owner. Mm -hmm. And when you were blogging, was that, was that a business or was that just something on the side that sort of evolved into a business that the development part? Yeah, it was blogging was just something I loved to do. Like I just started blogging because I thought it was fun. I was actually voted um, when I was, so I lived in San Diego for two years for grad school and like 2010, I was named one of the top five blogs in San Diego, which was fantastic. Wow. Which by the way, I'm just going to say I love, so I, San Diego is like my home away from home. I have a dear friend that owns an Airbnb there and I spend time a couple times a year there right near the campus of UC San Diego. 
So not a bad place to go no, to grad school. It's it's a fantastic place and so much inspiration. I had so I had a lifestyle blog and I had a food blog, which really is there a better place to do a food blog than San Diego? I don't know. I don't And lifestyle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you got you were voted in the you said top ten blogs. Is that what you said? Top five. Top, top five, five blogs in San yeah. Diego in, in that year. Um I mean it's just completely unexpected. I think a friend recommended me somehow. And um yeah, it just it it kind of took that unexpected turn into something else, which you know, I'm, I'm very grateful it did. Yeah. And so the, the name of your company is Alchemy and AIM, which I love that name. And I would just love to know the inspiration behind that. So I will tell you, I am terrible at naming things. Like there was nothing I think more torturous than having to like name a paper or a play or a poem when I was growing up, you know, when I was writing for creative writing classes or in college, didn't matter what naming things, terrible. But I was, um, I, I had hired my first like three people to my company, a, a admin assistant and two developers. Um, cause I was somehow determined not to do it by myself anymore. And smart. My ad, yeah. My admin <laughs> came in one day and she said, look, we need to talk about what you're calling this company. And I'm like, what do you mean? Cause I was just calling it, you know, like, I was just like, yeah, it's Brandy Bernoski. Boom. My company, <laughs> I mean, which worked great when I was a freelancer. But she let me know, you know, she's like, I've been working for you for a little while now. And it just, when people ask me what I do, I tell them and they find that to be really interesting. And they ask me who I work for. It, it just sounds weird. Right. <laughs> I yeah. understood that. So I, I decided, you know, okay, I have a team of three people. Maybe it is time to think about what the company could be beyond me and name it. And I was just sitting out on my porch. Um, like in this great little rocking chair and just kind of like, like trying to figure out what I name it. And I, I hate to say like, I really did come up. I feel like alchemy name is kind of a hipster name, but I love it simultaneously. And it just has that ring for me. It was about alchemy, which is all about kind of transforming, like starting off in one place and transforming to another place, which is really the, the journey I try to take our clients on. And then like the aim of an arrow of, of taking it, you know, making that transformation purposeful, like transformations don't just happen because you're bored and you don't have anything to do. They happen because you're going somewhere. And I always say the best websites have some sort of path or flow or journey to them. Like you're trying to take people somewhere. You're trying to encourage them to take an action. So the aim is like that action that you want people to take and that you want your business and life to take as well. So yeah, I love that. Just philosophically, it felt like just such a nice fit. And I just liked the way it kind of rolled off my, my tongue. And, um, yeah, so that was it. That was, boom, it was named um, kind of like, it really was like a strike of inspiration. I didn't start with like two lists of words and tried to combine them. It just happened to pop into my head. Yeah. And thank you to that employee for up-leveling you. Yes. Right? Yes. I really appreciate that because it is easy um, to kind of stay in how you're doing things. And it's always really fantastic to have those outside perspectives that kind of help you realize what you're doing. Yeah. So, so what, what I find fascinating, you know, because I interview lots of creatives and entrepreneurs and, and usually they're at a really fantastic place in the journey. Um, but there's always that middle, that beginning where, like you, you were, you didn't even really have the vision of a company yet. You were still just Brandy. You, you, but you did skip from, I was writing blogs, my blog won. I was, you know, friends were asking me to develop. And now all of a sudden, boom, I have three employees. What about that little spot there where you maybe weren't making any money yet? You were trying to decide, is this a business? And, and then you get to the employee stage. What was, did that happen pretty quickly? Did that happen organically? What was that moment in the journey like? I will say it, it didn't happen very quickly. I, I left grad school and I got a job at a nonprofit. Um, and so, I, you know, I was doing my 40 hour a week in my cube and things like that. And I did that for about two years, actually. So it's not like I left grad school and I was like, aha, I will become an entrepreneur. Here's the answer I've always been looking for. It, it did not hit me like that. I, it really took me 
it, it took some time to work up the courage to make that leap because I had just been so, I don't, I don't know, influenced by my parents, certainly like they wanted to, ha- they wanted to see me in a secure job with, you know, making money and happy and things like that. And, uh, it took a lot for me to get to the spot of saying, you know what, um, I'm going to become a freelancer. And I will say it was not easy at first. I had just enough work coming in. Cause I was, I was kind of doing some work on the side a little bit for some friends or, um, I had a designer I was doing some templates with and like a little bit of work would come in with that. So I felt like there was enough um, inflow to be able to make the leap. But I think, so I think I started, it was right around um, April 15th of 2013 that I actually like officially left my job and like started the business. Isn't it funny how we, we have those dates? Oh yeah. We know the day that we took the leap. It was huge. <laughs> and it's, it was scary and exciting. And like the first few months were good, but I will tell you that July, I actually did not make enough money to cover my rent. Like it wasn't that, you know, I had the money on the side I had saved up. So I was ready to take the leap and I had a bit of a net. Um, but I, I did not make enough money to pay rent then. And it really kind of led me to rethink a little bit of how I was doing things. Um, and it was right around, I would say it was right around August. Once I had that realization that I started just actually like telling people what I did. So there's, I feel like sometimes there's that spot in the entrepreneurial journey where you kind of like do it quietly and then you actually Mm -hmm. start telling people what you do. Yeah. And when you actually start telling people, that's when everything starts to change. So it was probably, oh, I don't know. I, I would say like I started getting some pretty big projects, like unexpectedly big. And I was getting referrals for, for like, I mean, when I think about the projects I turned down. I, I want to hit myself <laughs> because I'm just like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I missed that opportunity. But by November, December of that year, I was so, I was overworked. I wow. had work plus some. And I love, I love you. I love that for you, the moment was when you started speaking it out loud, declaring it. Yeah. And telling people that like, not just telling like my mom and dad who knew I was doing something crazy and working for myself, but even telling like past people, like all the friends I had made blogging. Um, I, I mean, I was just like anyone who would listen, <laughs> I think I would tell just, just a little bit like, Hey, I'm freelance developing. If, if there's anyone that you know who needs help, just, you know, send them my way. And that made it, it, it really did make a huge difference. I got some of my, to, to date, some of my largest clients. Wow. Yeah. So de- declaring it, but then asking. Yes. Yeah. And that's the um, stepping into your genius, stepping into your power. And when you talk about big clients, you know, you have this very impressive resume. Your company has done work for Brene Brown and Martha Beck and, Kate Northrup and Laverne Cox and some very, very powerful and influential women. So congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And how did those, were those jobs coming early or were, did those come, like how did the, you lead to that sort of client? Connections. Yeah. Honestly. Like, I, I mean, it's, it's funny when I tell people the story of like how I started working for Brene Brown and it was, Seriously, because one of one of the amazing women that I had met at Alt Summit, which is a blogging conference back in like, I don't even know what year that was, like 2011, she and I had become friends and she eventually started a, des- a graphic design business and wrote a blog about one of Brene's books, which Brene then found. And then they hired, you know, her company to do the design. And wow. I would say about eight months later, um, they were looking for someone for ongoing support for their website. And that was, you know, probably like a few months, you know, after I started everything. And it, my friend even said to me, she's like, Hey, I've got this client who needs help. Will you help her? And I'm like, Oh, of course. I'm like, I just love helping people. It doesn't matter to me who they are. I just want to make sure people are taken care of. And she told me who it was. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, I saw her speak on stage and I love Brene Brown. This is going to be so exciting. And my friend said to me, she's like, I didn't even know you were developing. Otherwise I would have talked to you months ago about doing work for her. But again, it was, I hadn't really announced it to the world. So Mm -hmm. once I announced it, 
the opportunities started to arrive. Yeah. I love that. And I love that you tie it back to connections. Yes. That, you know, I know that you believe that connecting people, helping them grow um, is really important to you. It really, it's core of who I am. I mean, I can't help it. Like I love helping people see what's possible for themselves. And it's kind of like, I, I sometimes say like, you know, you've got some people who read astrological charts or people's palms, like a website for me is, is, is that in a way it starts to see where, you know, I can see where someone has been and then you get a sense for where they're going and what's possible for them. Yeah. Um, And it's, it's exciting when you can help enroll them in the reality of that possibility, that it is something that they can really achieve, that it's not just you know, a possibility, it's a probability if you take the steps. And is that what you call um, the fifth dimensionality? Yeah, fifth dimensionality for me is, is really that like, that bringing of yourself into the online world in a new way. And fifth dimensionality is, is very interesting because it, it doesn't always look as we expect it to look. Like it doesn't match our four-dimensional self perfectly, you know? So I I feel like there are a lot of us out there who are introverts and online, you know, we're we're not quite introverts. We actually can be really um, outgoing, but in a different way and in a way that suits us, or we can be um, a little more glamorous or whatever it might be. Like there's so many kind of personality traits that are ours, like they belong to us. They're inside of us, but they um, are able to live out in, in the online world a little differently than they do in our day to day. So I have a question about that because I, um, I get just to be very honest here, I get exhausted with the importance of social presence and that digital image that I'm you know, as a business owner, it's almost required now to be out there. And, and I agree, we can show up in our own unique way. But there is sort of, I don't know, there is there is a template. Unfortunately, there is a way most people show up. And there is a, you know, the lifestyle brands, they all start to look the same. And the business coaches all start to look the same. And, and I guess, how do you help an individual or a company create impact, you know, humanize connections through technology, but still be authentic? Yeah, it's, it really starts with, I think, understanding first what you want the impact to be, like really understanding, taking that apart, looking at it um, from a bigger picture perspective. Um, but then also just kind of starting to throw out all of those formulas that we've been given, like that, and that's really hard to do as business owners. I'm not, I'm not saying that all the formulas don't have value. They do to some extent, but also like you can pick and choose. And if something doesn't suit you, you can let it go and that's okay. And it doesn't mean that your entire business is going to collapse or fall apart, but it's like, I've had a lot of people in the past who've come to me and they're like, I have to be on Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn and Instagram and do it all. And, you know, trying to do it all doesn't actually serve anyone, especially, I mean, it really doesn't serve you, it just depletes you. Um, so we really look at a variety of, of things. And I think it's, you know, all, all said and done, it's really when we start focusing on crafting an experience for other people. So it's almost like it becomes a little bit less about who you are and more about the experience you're providing and crafting for other people visiting your site. So it's about talking to them, not talking about yourself. You're going to talk about yourself too. Yes. But also just talking to them and making sure that they're led on the journey that they need to be led on and that everything that you're doing is going into shaping that journey. So I would, yeah, I would guess it would need to be really clear who you are talking to. Oh, it's just, it's essential. I mean, I, I know a lot of business owners do this as part of like the, the foundation for their company. And sometimes, you know, you don't do it at the beginning. You may do a year or two into having a business, but knowing your ideal client. And I don't mean knowing, you know, where they shop or their favorite movie, but like really knowing like what they want and like what their problems are, how, what problems you're solving for them particularly 
and how they feel about those problems, like what their blocks are. Like you need to get to the core of what's happening for them to really be able to talk to them about it. And when you do that, it feels like absolute magic for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but sometimes it's scary because you feel like, okay, what if I lose some people? What if I'm so specific that not everybody pays attention? (laughs) Yeah. Well, and and that's, I think that's the reality of anything. Like not, not everyone will pay attention and that's okay. Um, your business probably couldn't handle everyone paying attention. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's more important that, you know, I, I think, and again, same thing, like any business owner who's worked with a client that's not ideal knows the value of working with like clients that are ideal. Yeah, yeah. And it and, and it and it's right now there's so much vanilla. It's like you could almost swap pictures and swap post content um, so I think you're right that that honing in that clarity on the solution, the clarity that will draw the right person will then be the right person. Yeah. yeah. You talk also about digital experience versus digital presence. Is that sort of what we're talking about here? Yeah, it's I, I really look at digital experience as like the whole journey. I think, you know, for a long time, websites were looked as kind of like a online calling card and that you could pretty much build it and be done with it. But that's really not the case. And you certainly can't just like slap up a couple pages on a site and hope that people get to the contact page and contact. Like you you really need to think about how are you leading people? I mean, whether it's Instagram to your website or Instagram to a, you know, free PDF to a nurture sequence back to an offer eventually, like taking the time to really think through that journey and make sure that you are, you are, you're imbuing yourself into the journey. So it's not, it doesn't feel like, you know, vanilla copy everywhere. Like you're saying the same things over and over again, or saying what everyone else is saying, but you're actually like, again, really talking to the heart of what people have going on and care. Yeah. Like, I mean, it, it, it comes through is the reality of it. When you are, truly trying to take people on, you know, when you're trying to help them transform because you care and you're raising the stakes and you're saying, look, this is not a fit for you. If you're not ready to do these things, that really can, can be so impactful in and of itself. It can be like a wake up call for people. Yeah. Our websites kind of dying. It seems like social media is so important Everybody's on Instagram, you know, Facebook, even YouTube. I know in our businesses, because we have two companies, it seems like the website is becoming less and less important. And that could just be the experience that we've created. But I really would love to know your thoughts on that. I don't think websites are dying at all. I do think they're a piece of the bigger puzzle. And I think they've always been a piece of the bigger puzzle. Like, If you build a website, but then you never drive traffic to it, if you don't go out there and meet people or don't send, you know, cards out or don't, or if you're not on social media, people are not going to find your website. So they've always been just a piece of the puzzle. Um, I think they're actually, I think people are realizing now that they're actually a more important piece because we have no, you know, we all, we can own a website. You know, we can always drive people there. We can craft the experience we want with a website. If Facebook disappeared tomorrow, that could really damage a lot of people's business, especially if people don't have websites. They'd have to scramble and put one up very quickly. So I think it's important to remember, like, you don't own social media. Social media could potentially go or, you know, I mean, I certainly know a lot of, you know, business owners face like, you know, they'll run Facebook ads and then the algorithms change, you know? So you're you're facing, or, you know, even SEO, like Google's algorithms change and you're not number one anymore. So I really think, you know, when you can drive people to your website, when you can really capture them on a list, I really, I think that is so, so valuable. I don't think you have to do it all on your website. That's like a kind of a different decision for every business of how much needs to actually happen on the website versus on other social media channels or platforms or, you know, 
does this happen instead on the email list? I think those are business to business decisions, but I think ha minimally having a website that you can capture people's emails, those emails don't go away. Yeah. Yeah. Social media feels like, um, you know, the laser light that you like, f you like wiggle around the room and the cat chases it. <laughs> That's what social media feels like. I feel like I'm the cat chasing the laser light. And there's always something new. Like there's yeah. always that next hot social media network to be on. Um, and it can leave you kind of feeling pretty scattered, honestly. Right, <laughs> like, right. You have to almost yeah. be very conscious about like, no, my audience is on LinkedIn or no, my audience is really on Instagram or Pinterest and stay focused on that instead of kind of getting caught in like shiny object syndrome. Right. What do you think, like as a new entrepreneur, what do you think that a business owner should look for as they, you know, as they're stepping into technology, social media, like, like, like opportunities online? I mean, I always, so anytime I've had conversations with new business owners, the first thing I make sure is that they've actually had clients because you won't know where to spend your time until you have clients. So, and, and I always tell them like, just to work your network, tell your friends, tell your family, tell people that you're now offering, you know, pottery classes or whatever it might be. And let people know first, because word of mouth is so phenomenally strong and will drive people to you. When it comes, like, then when you get to the point where you're actually, okay, like, now you need to take on technology, I think you have to, as business owner, find technology that's a right fit for you. This is where I think, like, a lot of us kind of fall down rabbit holes of, like, well, my, you know, my friend uses this and she's been really successful. Um, and it may be more like, you know, a great example is I have seen business owners in the first year of their business get set up on Infusionsoft. They don't need Infusionsoft in the first year of their business. Like Infusionsoft is fantastic. There is a lot of really great things that it can do. But if you are just getting started and you have like five clients, you probably don't need Infusionsoft, you know? Yeah. And, and for those who don't know, Infusionsoft, I will say sometimes called Confusionsoft. It's like the customer relationship management. It can be e-commerce. It can be sales tracking. So it's an incredible product, super robust, but yeah, a lot of bells and whistles that many companies don't need in the first several years. Yeah. Yeah, you can get you can get lost in little things like that. So I really like to emphasize like what what problems are you running into with your business most immediately? Like a system that needs solving. So, you know, a quick one that a lot of people run into is that they need to schedule phone calls and they're going back and forth in emails trying to do that. You know, it, it any scheduling system can be a great solution and there's some simple free ones out there. So I really like to work with our business owners to make sure like we're solving the problems that they have now and taking a look at, you know, what may come down the line for them, but I'm not going to get a solopreneur set up on, you know, HR software if it's not time for that. So and I think that's just kind of like the whole the case, the entire time that you're in business is just constantly honing and looking at what is a right fit for you over and over again. And even that can be from a visual perspective. Like we at one point switched to a sales system that was not personally a good fit for me. And I do the sales in the company still. <laughs> so, you know, I, my, at, at that point, my business manager was like, but you need to use it. And I'm like, but I don't like it. You know, I don't <laughs> like going on there. It just feels so tedious. And it was and when probably I probably very uncreative. Oh, in, in, insanely so. It, it felt like I was being asked to be a robot, and I'm like, look, this doesn't work for me. And I, I eventually did find a sales system that worked really nicely for me, and it was more visual, and I felt more engaged by it, and it actually felt more fun to be in the system um, than the other one. So, you know, really just kind of like just understanding you may feel sometimes a little crazy as a business owner, and that's okay. You can like orient your business around your crazy. You don't have to orient it around other things that are out there simply because they're out there and other people say that they're good. Like you can find, it's, there's so much out there today. Like there's yeah. so, so many. Almost too much though. It can be so overwhelming. It can be a little overwhelming. Yeah. And, I mean, at some point you have to make a decision, but at least know that you don't have to go with like the biggest software or the one that everyone, most people use. Like you can do a solid Google search and just get a couple of options and 
experiment a little bit and find one that is going to be a good fit for you. Yeah. So we're talking about technology and tools to help grow our business and our our digital presence and digital experience. But what I would love to know is if we go back to the beginning and you started with acting and philosophy and physics and then moved into technology, where in your work do you find the place for self-expression and creativity now? Problem solving. I had no idea. So this is interesting because I think I was always a very creative creative problem solver. Like I loved puzzles as a kid. I particularly loved every Christmas my mom would do, um, she would do a scavenger hunt for us and she would would tell us it was from Santa, but I'm like, I know, mom, I know your handwriting. So (laughs) you're trying to disguise your hand. I have to tell you, I even practiced Santa's handwriting from a book one time and my kids made me compare the signature (laughs) to the book signature. They always knew too. (laughs) Yeah, they do. But it was, I like, I loved those scavenger hunts so much and like using my brain to like solve a riddle or solve a problem. So I think you like, and and it kind of weaves this way down. Like I, in, in all of my academic classes, I really loved taking two subjects. Like, I, I mean, really my interest in religion was in the intersection of religion and science and how people can um, think about two differing belief systems and hold them together. Sometimes, you know, sometimes people say, well, I'm one or the other, but I've known a lot of people who are both religious and scientific. So um, it was always, I always found places to be really creative and like coming up with new ideas solving problems. And I feel like I still do it with clients, like in talking to them about the website and what's possible, there's creative problem solving there. It happens all the time in my own business. I'm always looking at like, okay, what's not working optimally. And like, what are the possibilities of what I could do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can, I mean, I can absolutely go out and ask for advice. And sometimes I do. And I talk to like my business coach or, you know, other entrepreneurs with teams or whatever it might be. But um, I really love putting my brain on, on different problems and just kind of exploring possibilities and thinking of like new interesting ways that things can be done. It doesn't even mean you have to invent new technology. Sometimes it's just in the, the process of it. Right. So, yeah. yeah. And then in going back to the, um, the study of theater and, and acting and you talked about you know, human to human connection. And um, as we wrap up, what I'd love to hear is, because I know, um, I know for you, it came up in your bio and in conversations that we've had before that just meaningful connection, living in your truth, showing up, you know, completely as yourself, radiating your light into the world is so important to you. And I just would love to get your perspective on how we do that with technology? I think it's, it's utilizing technology for the points that, like for the data gathering points and being human in the, the points that need to be human. And let me actually illustrate that with an example because I think that's helpful. One of the things I do when new clients come to me is I send them to a questionnaire so I can get the basics from them. So that's how I'm utilizing technology, mainly an, an online questionnaire that gathers basic information, website URL, goals with their site, things like that. What that enables me to do is not to ask those questions when I have the call with them. They're already taken care of. And I can go so much deeper with my conversation about what they want what they're looking to create in the world. So it allows for a more human conversation to happen because I've already used technology to get some of the data gathering out of the way. Mm, I love that. Yeah, because really you can put together the, you know, the perfectly designed, perfectly developed website, but if it's not communicating, it's not connecting, which is what you're going to get in that human to human interaction. And, you know, the the insightful questioning and, and really uncovering who they are, what their hopes, their dreams are. I think that's what I if I think of your the name of your company, Alchemy and Aim, that's sort of the combination. Yeah, yeah that's really cool. 
Yeah. Yeah. I love, I love finding opportunities for that. And it's the same thing. It's like, I can spend time with someone going back and forth around a meeting time via email. Is that the most human conversation I can have with that person? No. So why don't I, you know, outsource that to a scheduling software so that I can have a more human conversation with them? Yeah. And then obviously you're building rapport, you're building relationship, and that's why people stay with you for years. Yep. Absolutely. So Brandy, do you, are you familiar with the Enneagram? I am. So I have a guess of, uh, cause I, I'm, I am a lover of the Enneagram. I'm certified for individual coaching and, and team training with the Enneagram. And in, I just have a feeling I know what your number is, but I'm going to, I'm going to ask you what, what Enneagram number are you? I'm a nine. I'm a piece. You're a nine. Is that what you thought? I thought maybe a four. I'm a nine. Oh, I love that. For yeah. a peacekeeper type. It, it really it comes out eventually, yeah. Yeah. No, I was thinking four because of the creativity, the diverse, but, but I totally see the nine, yeah. You must be a great boss, too. Nines are really good leaders. I, I do everything I can to make sure my team is well taken care of. Like, for me, it's just all about having that balance between, you know, not even just between work and life, but just knowing, like, you know, we live our lives to bring more joy to the world. And that includes to our families. So it's to our clients, to our families. And um, yeah, I really, I really do strive to make sure that I am, I am the leader that they deserve. That's awesome. And just because I'm curious, and you said you love books, um, either what's the book you're reading or what's your favorite book? A favorite, favorite book is um, Paulo Coelho's The Alchemist, hands down. Like, it's just such a fantastic, wonderful read. And I, I think probably it's, I read that years before I thought of naming the company and it just felt like a, you know, it probably just burned in my brain in that way. Perfect. I love it. Brandy, I just so enjoyed learning about you and your company. And I know our listeners, I'm sure, got tons of incredible tips and encouragement. And it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for your time today. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been a wonderful conversation. Thanks, Brandy. Okay, Clara, I'm very interested to hear what you have to say about this interview. I will tell you that it did give me a little bit more hope. I sort of have a little bit more, I don't know, passion for finding my authentic voice, creating connection, and not getting trapped up in the consumer side of the internet and social media. Totally. Yeah. That was kind of my takeaway too, because I was an English literature major who now works in marketing and content creation and things that are very internet based. So it was really inspiring to hear that Brandy didn't pigeonhole herself either. She let herself study very historic things like philosophy and art and science, but then was able to go into a field that's very tech based. So I just love that she combines those two things. So for those of you who don't know, my son, Noah, is uh, part of my audio engineer team, and he gets to hear these conversations as they're being recorded. And this one was fascinating for him because he loves science. He loves religion. He loves philosophy. He's studying technology. So it was a great lesson for him in be open to what you love. You never know where it's going to lead you. Totally. I love that. That's the perfect way to say it. And one of the sort of common denominators among a lot of our guests is that their journey is a combination of all these different experiences, all these different paths, but then it culminates, at least in the space where we're having our conversation, where it's this it's this like gathering of all they've brought up to their life to that point. Um, so it just it just reminds us that nothing is wasted. Nothing is too small. We never know. Yes, Elle, I completely agree with that. And it actually reminds me of the work that you've been doing lately with people around the Enneagram, helping people determine their type and ultimately how all of the pieces of their life and their personality fit together to create their calling and purpose. Yeah, the Enneagram is fascinating in that because it sort of exposes things about ourselves that we thought were 
oh, I don't know, bad habits or patterns that keep getting in our way sometimes. And then we realize, oh, no, this is sort of my natural wiring. And how can I work with this? And it's it really unlocks potential. It unlocks awareness so that people can really pull those pieces of their life into one like bigger life. And if you're interested in learning about the Enneagram, you can go to Zimmerman dot com backslash Enneagram and through my website you can also sign up for a clarity call where we spend some time talking about the Enneagram maybe diving a little bit into your type um, so I'd love for you to join me it's lzimmerman.com right on the homepage clarity call Thank you so much for joining us for today's episode of She Made It. And as I always say, if she made it, you can too.